Great Britain is best enjoyed at your own pace, and nothing beats motoring through the countryside where you get your choice of everything this enchanting island has to offer. I meander from northern Scotland, through England, to the southern reaches of the island and Wales. Here's something you don't see every day, parsley honey. The coastal city of Swansea is the second largest in Wales, but the most renowned. Local poet Dylan Thomas once called his hometown an ugly, lovely town, a direct reference to its confusing and unattractive jumble of new and old, a town rebuilt after being virtually destroyed in World War II. While I always appreciate a little sightseeing, nothing can keep me from my real passion in life, checking out the local market. I can smell one a continent away, so I follow my nose to the Swansea market. The UK really is a snout to tail society and you can see here all the different bones, hearts, kidneys, all the pluck from all the different animals are for sale all the time because people actually cook and use them. Wild game is available in almost every market as well. Here, partridge, wild pigeon, and pheasants that have been cleaned and seasoned ready for the oven. That's convenience food. Sometimes, a name alone will make me want to try ah, a dish. With a name like that, it's got to be good. What are faggots, peas, and gravy? Faggots are a traditional Welsh dish. Uh-huh. And you know what mushy peas are? And yeah. gravy. But what's in a faggot? Um, meat, onions, pig's liver, all mashed up with a bit of herb. Oh, kind of like a meatloaf? Yeah. Now that's stereotypical British food. Mm. Dynamite. And if you want more tradition while in Swansea, then there's another item you must try, cockles. The Welsh cockle industry is revered worldwide. Carol Watts' family has been in the cockle harvesting business for decades. Her booth is a fixture here, serving up cockles and several other Welsh treats. Uh, the cockles are a bit small at the moment, mm -hmm. so it's quite a, a struggle out there to get them. If there's many big cockles, yeah. so that's how they are small. Bigger cockles are better than smaller cockles? Definitely. Everyone wants the big cockles. Who doesn't, really? It's like anything else, isn't it? Yes. What's the black stuff there? That's a local delicacy. That's lava bread. It's seaweed. Mm -hmm. Just water. It's pure seaweed. And these big slug snail things right there, what are those? Yeah, they're whelks. Sea oh, sea fabulous. Yeah. I love whelks. Yeah. I like snails of all kinds. Right. Tough to catch, though. They move so quickly. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, I'm going to want to try, uh, try all of that. Carol serves her whelks with a little pepper, vinegar, and some coarse local sea salt. They taste like an earthy sea slug. Yeah? Yeah. I mean, you know, they, they taste like little crawly worms filled with seawater, right. and I love it. Good. Whelks are just sea snails. They live in shells, not unlike these two right here. Some people find them tough. I don't know why. You gotta chew an apple, you gotta chew a steak or a pork chop. What's the big deal with chewing a whelk? The Cotswolds, in the heart of central England, is often described as the jewel in England's crown. Handsome manor houses and churches are the byproducts of centuries of lucrative sheep farming. When the heyday of wool making declined nearly 300 years ago, these buildings remained virtually unchanged. Just two hours outside London, this is as close as you can come to stepping back in time. Preserving history is a vital part of the lifestyle here, which applies to the food scene as well. I've been invited to the home of Rob Reese, one of the top chefs in the Cotswolds, who's famous for his modern take on traditional English fare. By the time I arrive, prep has begun on the main course, jugged hare, which is essentially a wild rabbit stewed in its own blood. <laughs> that looks fabulous. Big! It's, it's, it's a great piece of meat. Uh, we've got, this is part of the saddle. So mm -hmm. you've got the saddle and you've got the back legs. You don't use the front legs at all. Uh, and I'm marinating in port and some rosemary. Beautiful. And that's it. And then what we've done, we've kept the hearts and the livers, and that's the blood. Oh. Absolutely spectacular, and it smells so clean. Rob strongly believes in cooking with foods indigenous to the region and staying true to his craft. It is amazing how many rules we, we've created for cuisine these days, some of which necessary, some of which 
just a lot of to do about nothing. I think a lot of it is so that we have more chefs on television. That's probably true. It gives yeah, us a job. We shouldn't yeah, be we, we we shouldn't be trashing it too much. Yeah. We're putting ourselves out of work. Mm. And then in goes the blood. But I'm going to leave the livers and the hearts out. Now, let me ask you a question. The blood mm. is both for flavor and because it's a natural thickener? Yeah, natural thickener. A lot of protein. Yeah, absolutely. Once the hair goes into the oven, we start on the heart and liver meatballs. Certainly not one for the squeamish. No, but I, I'm, I, I will say I've eaten a fair share of rabbit livers and rabbit kidneys, and I'm a huge fan. Just, the livers uh, and kidneys are mixed good. with a little pork, some spices, and then go in with the hair. While the main course cooks, we start on another British classic, Christmas pudding. Now, Christmas pudding is, is easy. You just chuck everything in together in a bowl. Uh, <laughs> you let it marinate for 24 hours, and then you cook it. It's as easy as that. Uh, breadcrumbs, first of all. And that bowl you're mixing it in is my great-grandma's bowl. Uh, and tradition, we always made our Christmas puddings in that. This unusual pudding has been around in various formats since the Middle Ages, and the taste is not as tame as the name may imply. Even though suet is a main ingredient in most, the recipe can vary from family to family. Some people put grated potato into it. What I would say to you is don't treat Christmas pudding like a dustbin. <laughs> this pudding calls for some lemon zest, almonds, spices, and a lot of muscle. I love doing Christmas puddings. It's one of the most exciting times of the year. Next, the wet ingredients. Eggs, molasses, and of course, alcohol. So put some Guinness in there. Put hairs on your chest. Yeah. Or even on your head. Yeah. Well, you never know. <laughs> the field is fallow up there, my friend. A little bit of brandy. And that's Christmas pudding. Oh. As tradition would have it, Rob makes and gives away dozens of puddings every year. So he often has one on hand that's ready to cook. Take up to six months the process. Here we are. Yeah. That is what you end up with. So you see how it's absorbed it. Oh yeah. That's As it. the pudding goes for one last steam, we start oh. in on the jugged hair. Oh. Smell that. <laughs> the saddle. You know, the sauce, perfect. All right, jugged hair. Mm. Needs more sauce. I have some, and I'll tell you, it's strong. But you can taste the marinade all the way through. Mm. I think it's quite unique flavor. It's irony. It's got that minerally irony, gamey mm. thing happening. But it's got that little edge to it that this type of stuff often does. There is something elusive in here, if you like. Mm -hmm. And I'm putting that down to be in the blood. Yeah. I wouldn't go so far as to say that you can, uh, you can taste the blood and sweat and the toil, but you can really taste the history in a dish yeah. like this. Well, you went to the pudding. This is one of the greatest family moments I think that everybody should enjoy is the Christmas pudding. And always make a point of not putting your holly on until the flame has gone out, otherwise you could be in trouble. Uh, Note to you amateurs at home. <laughs> How big a piece would you like? Oh, very, very small. Right. Which means about a third of it. <laughs> <laughs> Smells like heaven.